Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. I want to address the aspect of diversity on our podcast, especially race diversity. To be clear, we want to see more farmers of all races successful. We want to feature farmers of all races on our podcast podcast as well. You know, our podcast is focused on thriving farmers, those who are seeking to thrive, those who are thriving. Now, since the beginning, we've reached out to a wide variety of guests, and frankly, it's been disappointing in the respect to racial diversity. You know, since early this year, we've revisited our commitment to this. We've had conversations with many in our community and without, and reached out to several organizations about helping us to find more diverse guests, but it's been disheartening we usually get one of three responses, either radio silence, or that's cool, but they actually never booked the episode, or you aren't diverse enough, so I'm not coming on, to which we respond, that's the very reason you should come on, so you can help uh, share your story and uh, your point of view on the subject. Now, today's guest is Mike Dixon. He has a unique point of view, but that's what we're committed to, You know, sharing all sorts of views on these episodes. If you're interested in sharing your thoughts on the podcast, we'd love for you to head on over to www.thrivingfarmerpodcast.com, click on the Be Our Guest in the top menu, and we look forward to connecting to see if you'd be a good fit for the show. Thanks. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. Joining me today on the Thriving Farmer podcast is Mike Dixon, who is known on YouTube as the Fit Farmer. Mike is a former professional natural drug-free bodybuilder, personal fitness trainer, and nutritional coach turned farmer slash homesteader. A number of years ago, they sold their house, furniture, and all their possessions, bought a yurt, and moved to the Concord, North Carolina area to start a homestead. Today, years later, their homestead provides food for their family and many of their farm customers they serve. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Glad to be on. Yeah. I mean, you and I actually have gone back a number of years because when I was working with Ray closely on some of his in-person events, we had you come on as the photographer slash videographer. Yes. And that was a, it was an enjoyable experience to be out there to meet you and Ray Tyler. And I believe Curtis Stone was out there uh-huh. at that time as well. It was a, it was a real, real blast. Yeah, I, I, it's a really loss that he's no longer doing that type of events, but yeah. uh I'll try to convince him again next year. Go. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, Mike, give us a little bit of your background. Where were you before you uh, sold everything? Well, before we sold everything, we were living in the city limits and just a typical suburban brick house. Mm. Uh, I think we were probably on, oh, man, not even a, a half of, a, an, a, of an acre. Mm-hmm. And uh, prior to... Uh, that is what, where we, when we, my wife and I, we bought our first, that was our first house together. Mm. And, uh, once we got that house, I was like, you know what? I want to have a family garden. I've never grown anything in my entire life before. And Uh I want to grow something. I want to, I want to feel that what it's like to to grow something. Uh, cause growing up, we, I was far removed from where my food came from. We ate terrible growing up sugar all through our diets, pop tarts mm-hmm. every day. I was one of the people that would add sugar to your, to my frosted flakes. It was just Ooh. really bad. <laughs> uh, the question is, do you have the cavities to prove it? <laughs> I actually do. I, I, and, and that is actually uh, kind of uh, a learning lesson. I showed to my kids and trying to encourage mm-hmm. them to eat whales. Like, look at my mouth. Mm-hmm. I don't want yours to be like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. I can feel you exactly so, same here. So as I started to get older and uh, I began to be more interested in fitness and health and, and, and wanting to eat healthier and, and have that, that really nice physique, kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger or some of the comic book characters I was always interested in. Uh-huh. So that combined with years later, as we finally got our house and I w- had worked in the health and wellness industry for years, I was like, you know what? The best way to know that I'm eating really good food and that food is good for me is to know the story behind it. And the best way to know the story behind it is actually start growing something myself. 
Mm -hmm. While we were in the city, we started just growing a little bit here and there. And actually the first time I tried to grow something, we had ripped out all of the ornamental beds in our, our front yard of our suburban house and got rid of things like the holly bushes, the nandinas. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to grow stuff in these beds. Mm -hmm. so I did that. <laughs> it was kind of pretty radical. Uh, planted my first seed. It's pretty exciting when something started to germinate. And then I was like, my mother-in-law came and looked and she was like, uh, that's grass you're growing. I was like, ah! <laughs> but I uh, didn't let that little failure stop me. Uh, I actually started having success, some successes of growing different things of lettuces and uh, radishes and different things around our, our small uh, suburban plot. And uh, I was actually around that time, I was inspired by the work of the late Jules, Jules DeVays from the <laughs> Urban Homestead out in Pasadena, California. I saw a number of videos that he was featured in on YouTube and all the things that he could just grow on a 10th of an acre. Mm. And uh, we just started growing more. And, and as we started having children, we got them involved and outside at an early age. I wanted them to have a different, different diet than I had growing up and, a, and mm -hmm. a different knowledge and background of actually knowing where their food came from. And we got to the point where we were growing things all over the yard and even had, we were the only ones in the neighborhood growing corn in our front yard and tomatoes in the front beds. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then you decided to, okay, this is not enough and we want to be out in the wilderness or in at least in like uh, the rural areas. That's, that's exactly right. It got to the point where as I was growing more, I wanted to grow even more. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the things that really was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back for us moving out of the city was I really wanted to raise chickens. Mm -hmm. uh, I started watching do at the time documentaries like Food Inc. and seeing Joel Salton. And then I started getting really interested in what Joel Salton was doing. And it's like, well, I want to have fresh farm eggs. And uh, I was still kind of eating a high protein diet anyways. And I was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I, 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 want, I want my own eggs. But you know what? The, the city ordinances where we live said, nope, can't do any, any chickens here. And our neighbors were pretty strict, so we weren't, we weren't even going to try that. And you were like, we were like, you know what? Let's just get out of here. We, we just felt really restricted in so many ways. Mm. Uh, there was actually a lot of traffic kind of going up and down our road. We didn't feel like it was conducive for how we wanted to raise our family. We wanted our kids to be able to just get out and explore, be connected with nature, where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. and, and we just wanted a completely different lifestyle. And uh, so we, we made that decision to just pretty much sell everything we had because we were working on pretty much the no budget. So to do that, to make the move, we needed to pretty much sell everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, my, uh, we actually decided to move out onto my, uh, my wife's parents' property. They have a, a second property where he was, um, her, actually her grandparents used to live. And uh and it was no one's really taking care of it. So we were like, you know what? That would be a good place to set up a yurt. And uh, we were kind of going back and forth on that. And then we was like, you know what? Let's see if we can find one. And we actually found a used one on Craigslist. We were oh, like, really? Cha-ching, there we go. <laughs> Which saved us a lot of money. Yes, those things are not cheap. <laughs> no. <laughs> so we sold our house in the city, most of our belongings. That paid for our yurt. That paid for also my farm truck that I had. And that, that set us up to be able to move out here to, to start our homestead slash farmstead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so then you've got the property. What were your plans from the beginning with like, were your plans to actually sell things or was it more to be self-sufficient first? It was kind of a mixture and it was kind of, I was looking back somewhat of a, a, a confusion at first because you're just excited. And mm -hmm. a lot of times when people are, especially that when they're new to the homesteading and, and this way of life, they just want to do everything. And that's kind of what it was for us at the beginning. Just, I just wanted to do everything. I just wanted to have that lifestyle mm -hmm. of homesteading and, and doing things, raising animals and, and growing our own food. And I actually didn't think at first you could actually make any money with farming. So I mm -hmm. really didn't necessarily see it as a business at first. I just saw it as a lifestyle that we aspired to live and uh, we were going to make it happen. Uh, so uh, after being inspired by Joel Salton, I was really interested and I was reading his book, uh, Pasture Poultry Profits and things like that. And I was like, you know what, we're going to do some pasture poultry. 
and uh, we're gonna see if we can start making some additional income with that in addition to the other things like growing growing, growing a vegetable garden and things like that but then once we got onto the property and and really started assessing things um i realized that our property really what didn't isn't the best context to be raised in pastured poultry mm. so we kind of went for a, a lull for a while just kind of doing what we can and trying to just continue to get some momentum of just making the homestead work. And then sometime after that, I came across Curtis Stone on Permaculture Voices. And he, mm. did, this, he did this series uh, just talking about urban farming and, and, and really how it, the ends of it and how it works. And I just listened to every single week that he was on there. And I was like, you know what, that, that is what we're going to do. That is going to be how uh, we, I actually got to the point where I was like, I really want to leave my job of working in the fitness industry. I was like, I just feel like my life has changed and I'm ready to move on to a different chapter in my life. Mm. I actually got to the point where I hated the job. And, mm. uh, and that was actually one of the biggest things that gave us the, gave me the opportunity to do that and actually make it financially work for us as far as not just being a homestead, but making our homestead profitable as well. Mm -hmm. So what would you say the main income streams now for your farm is? Uh, right now, and, and that's kind of changed as well. It is uh, the things that we do through our uh, business as YouTube and all that, that it entails, and, and then the farm. I don't work off farm anymore. I've been, mm -hmm. I think it's been two years maybe since I've had to work off the farm at a for somebody else. Um, so it's been rewarding to do that. And uh, that was a process. And uh, any, I don't know if there's any new farmers listening to this, but that would be one of the things that I would encourage people to do is if you're working off the farm, you got to realize you can't just leave that job right away. It, it would be best to make mm -hmm. it a process mm -hmm. and phase your way into working full time on the homestead. And that's what I had to do. I had to work at least four to five years off the farm. So that way I could be at a point where I could be here full time. Yeah. Or you have to have at least a year's uh, savings of income saved up. <laughs> that's yeah. what I tell people, <laughs> yeah. which is very tough. And so that's why having that gradual transition, I think is usually preferred. Yes. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about what does a typical week look like for you on the farm now? Okay. The week, our typical week, basically we run Sunday through Friday, just wide open. Saturdays is our, our rest day. Um, we don't do farmer's markets. We tried that for a while wasn't for us. I know it works for some people, but uh, it's not for us um, for uh, multiple reasons. And uh, we do, um, right now, I kind of answered two questions at the same time, probably. <laughs> Sorry about this. But um, we also sell to, we do sell to like CSA customers as well as um, to restaurants. Okay. So we tailor our week kind of around uh, servicing them in addition to what we need to do on the farm for the YouTube purposes as well. Uh -huh. So uh, our Sundays is, is our, our day where we, we the day kind of starts off, well, each week kind of starts off with me just kind of sitting down, brainstorming and making a list and prioritizing of what needs to be done that week. Uh, projects will change from week to week, but there are certain tasks that need to be done pretty much every week, especially during the main growing season. So, uh, the kids, as they have gotten older, they're able to take care of chores like uh, my sons take care of tending to the chickens. So they'll, they'll feed the chickens in the morning, and then later on in the day, they'll, they'll take care of gathering the eggs. My daughter, she's in charge of our ducks. Uh, she'll take care of gathering the duck eggs earlier in the day before lunch, and then later on, she'll feed the ducks later on towards the evening. So having people, having the family that can chip in has been a, uh -huh. a big help to me. So I'm not having to do every aspect of the, of the farm. Uh, and that gives me a chance to kind of prioritize and, and delegate. Uh, but w there's times of the year where, ra where we are raising um, broilers. We have been able to, as we have grown and transitioned, to be able to have some broilers that we're raising. So when we are doing that, I'm the one that'll be taking care of the broilers or when we have chicks or ducklings and each morning I'll start off with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that'll be uh, all these chores are done all through the week. Uh, and then after that, I would say pretty much each day kind of starts with me getting started anywhere from uh, 530 to eight o'clock of doing that, the brainstorming, mm -hmm. the, 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 the morning chores. And then after we kind of take care of chores, 
Then we all come back in around uh, breakfast time, uh, which is usually somewhere around eight, eight o'clock or so. And then we all just sit down for a meeting and then we kind of go over the plan for the day. I've kind of uh-huh. started that, but I uh, recently had a, um, a trip to Polyface Farm and saw where Daniel does that, Daniel Salton. Yep. And that kind of encouraged me even more to keep up with that because it kind of gives everyone a clear vision of what to do that day. And you kind of know who's responsible for what, so there's no confusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the setting the priorities and then owning the projects. Exactly right. Exactly right. So uh, we, 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 each of us in the family, there's five of us, have different, different chores that we do. Uh, I do have a helper that comes on the farm usually about once a week. So when we have big projects, mm-hmm. uh, I'll have him assist and help us with that. Uh, but for the most part, it's us on a day-to-day basis taking care of the uh, the, the task on the farm and that includes starting things we grow microgreens starting seeds for that starting se- seeds for our our other plants and other starts uh making sure that things are working properly like irrigation uh harvesting we usually harvest our harvest days are usually wednesday or thursday mm-hmm. uh, some we do a alternate week with our csa so we have like group A and group B. So one oh, week that's nice. we deliver to say group A and we deliver to them on Thursday of, of one week. And then the following week we have group B where we're delivering to them on Fridays. So our harvest day will usually be about two days before uh, our delivery day. So now with the, the CSA, do you do any like added services to that? I mean, I know your backgrounds in health and wellness. Do you try to do any tips around that or is it mainly just the, the vegetable products or the uh, different farm products you're selling them? It's mainly just the farm products, but a lot of them will follow us on uh, our email newsletter where I'll provide tips in that way, mm. um, as well as our YouTube channel and Instagram where I'll just provide tips along the way. Uh, but there's no like added additional services that they get per se individually. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you know, you, I think at the beginning, you talked a little bit about the big vision of just wanting to be on the land, but would you say as the years have gone by, has that changed? I mean, has your why for farming changed? It, oh, it definitely have. My original vision and purpose and why was strictly to just to be more connected to, to our food and to, to eat healthier and to, and to be healthier. That's still a part of the why. But as the years have gone by, uh, it really, it really gives me, I don't know, it really fills my blood, <laughs> whatever it needs uh-huh. each day, knowing that we have an opportunity to, to just share life together, to, to, I spend pretty much most of the hours with my family each day. And that, that is really, really uh, uh-huh. such a great rewarding feeling to know that we're, we're sharing life together that we, we know each other. We know what, what each other likes and dislikes. And it's not like I get to see them grow up on pictures on a desk that I actually get to see different um, special moments in their life because we're, we're here, we work together. We do pretty much everything together. Mm. Um, And that is my uh, big reason why. And, and also being able to inspire and encourage others to live a life more connected to your family and to, to the earth uh, through the various things that we do like on YouTube and things like that. That is my bigger reason why now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What do you think is the hardest thing that you've done as a farmer? Ooh, the hardest thing that I've done as a farmer, I wouldn't say it's one specific thing, but I would say all of us, when you, especially if you, you haven't grown up in this way of life, you over romanticize what it's going to be about. Mm. And uh, once you start doing it, uh, a lot things are a lot harder than you think they would be. The work is harder. Uh, things like animals dying is a, you don't really anticipate happening. You don't really mm. see a lot of the pests and diseases that will happen with your plants and things like that. And you don't necessarily envision uh, you burn it out, <laughs> but yeah. a lot of those things happen. So I would say the hardest thing for me is after that honeymoon phase was over of going into this homesteading life, farming life, after that was over, just being in the reality of the moment of, man, I don't know if I can do this. Uh (laughs) This is hard. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Did I make the wrong decision? Getting through that phase, that was the probably the hardest thing for me is what I would say. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. No, I get that. And, and the thing is, is that comes in so many different waves. It's not just one time. It's because especially, um, you know, they, what do they say? If it was easy, everyone would do it. And I think that absolutely applies to farming. Oh, yeah. um, because I mean, in those different, um, as a friend of mine says, you know, new level, new devil. So yeah. every <laughs> single time you change it up, oh, now we have something new we have to worry about and think yeah. about. So um, yeah, but I, I think absolutely there's those aspects at those layers of just like, can we actually do this? And what is the solution for this? Because if, at some of those, remember my early days, we had peacocks. Now, don't ask me why we bought peacocks, <laughs> but someone convinced us that they were like our next, you know, we were going to make all sorts of money. Well, I couldn't get them to stop dying on me. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, and they're not cheap. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was one of the reasons we switched to vegetables because they're a lot easier and one dies, they're a lot cheaper. <laughs> so. Good move. That was a good move. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, that's, that's great. Uh, what would you say your mentors, I know you talked about Joel, who else would you say have been your mentors along the, the journey? Um, Curtis Stone, Justin Rhodes, Justin Rhodes has been really instrumental for me. Mm. Um, being able to connect with him in a number of ways. I know he's not necessarily in, he didn't necessarily inspire me as a farmer, but just general homesteader, mm-hmm. YouTuber, and, and just helping others and, and really understanding uh, the business side of things. And um, I think that's uh, kind of key for anybody in any area. You're not just necessarily learning from the people who are necessarily specifically in your niche, but also need to learn from a business side, especially if you're running a business, to mm-hmm. learn just general principles of how to do things is, is, is really key. So, um, just him, um, and, um, Ray Tyler was uh, the times that I've been able to connect with him. He's been very, very helpful as well. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. He is a great, great farmer. So uh, when you started your farm, if you could, let's say go back then and uh, like restart it right now, what systems would you go back and put in place sooner rather than later? Oh, uh, let's see here. Where would I start with that? Our farm is kind of taking sh- different shapes throughout. One thing that I would say is, um, and this might be something for everybody, and I know Joel has recommended this before, was when you first move on to your property, don't try to do things right away. Really assess and get to know your property and see how water flows and, and things like, like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if I could go back again, I would probably um, – we, our, our lot was pretty wooded. And if I had the resources at that time and was able to do it, I would remove more trees than uh, at the start of it. Uh-huh. I would also, a lot of times we, we do things based on emotion and feelings. I would really sit down and, and try to prioritize more. I didn't do that in the beginning. It was more of just a reacting and an act on feeling instead of sitting down like I, I try to do now. Mm-hmm. really see what really needs to be done on a day-to-day basis because at the beginning it was like i was just running all around and not really doing anything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so doing a lot more big picture before you got into the nitty-gritty exactly right and i, I would also say finding a way to get other people to help you more in various ways and 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 reward them for that in any way that you can, whether it be financially or produce or whatever, but to get more additional help when you can. Mm -hmm. Build that community. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're right now in the middle of starting a new farm and I could not be doing it without our community. We've gotten incredible relationships. And obviously because we lived in the community a couple of years before we actually started to, you know, kind of scaled this one up, Uh um, we were able to meet those, but it's also been great just kind of like our city council, you know, being able to talk to some of them, get them out to the farm, sit down at the kitchen table and say, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're trying to do. And then have them going to bat for us with the city manager. Um, and they've actually, <laughs> they've had a lot more success getting things through than I have. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's um, that community aspect is so key. Um, and I think too, is, is finding those right resources too, is the right fit resources. You know, there's probably a dozen excavators in your area, yeah. but finding one that you work with well. Exactly right. um, yeah, like right now we actually have a project which uh, I had to get done. So I had to hire the first guy, not the first guy, but like the first guy that would show up and give me a bid um, because literally I couldn't get anyone else. And that probably wasn't the best idea. Um, 
the job wasn't quite done how I wanted it done. I mean, we're making it work, yeah. but um, you know, now I'm actually, because I have a little bit more time now, I'm actually interviewing different contractors, you know, talking to people that actually done work with them um, and just trying to build that right fit community for what we need to do on the property. There you go. Yeah. That, all that's definitely, definitely important. That's neat to hear. So with that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Mike Dixon. Looking to start or grow your farm business? You need a compelling farm plan that you can share with investors, convince your significant other with, or just to give yourself peace of mind. We have created a new program called the Start Your Farm Intensive. In it, you'll learn how to develop your farm idea to make sure you take all the factors into consideration for your context and your climate. You'll learn how to craft a one-page business plan that helps clearly define your target customer and lay out the necessary characteristics of your business. You will understand the three financial documents that every farm needs to fill out to make sure you are making money. And we'll give you all that as templates too. So you have the templates to fill out for your farm business. We'll also go through funding. So where to go for funding for the various stages and parts of your business. Starting a farm is hard. Starting a farm without a proven plan is almost impossible. Join us today. Go to growingfarmers.com forward slash start for more information. Now, what did past students have to say? Corey says, the exercises and spreadsheets helped me make the learning process easier and more real. Jenna says, I gained the support system and resources I needed for when I'm ready for the next step. And finally, the worksheets make you think out every aspect of the business step by step. Go ahead, join us today, growingfarmers.com forward slash start. We are back with Mike Dixon, also known as the Fit Farmer. Mike, you farm with your family. Um, and you talked a little bit earlier how you have like, everyone has their chores. Is there more division of roles? I mean, like when you're harvesting, do people do specific things or do you guys just share the workload? Uh, overall, we share the workload. Uh, I definitely provide the direction on it. Uh, but sometimes I give options on, Hey, this is what we need to do. Who would like to do this? Like today we, we had some assignments on, we need to harvest some Japanese peppers, or you can go inside and pull out some of the tomatoes of the greenhouse. Which one do you want to do? It's like, yeah. Take the peppers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're, we're trying to do more and more of that. There's certain things that a uh, specific thing. We try to do it age based too. I'm not going to try to have our, our four year old, uh, mm -hmm. go and try to round up any of the <laughs> livestock or anything. Um, yeah. I, I try to do it based on what they're capable of doing. And that, that's a learning process too. <clears throat> and some things with working with kids can take a little bit longer than mm -hmm. it would for me and our adult would do. But, and I, I definitely want to encourage parents to think about it this way is realize you're, you're investing in that child or in that younger person or whoever, when you're, teaching them to do something and and you have to look at it that way yes it could probably be done faster if you were to do it but you know what investing in them they'll eventually get better and better and you get to the point where you're multiplying your efforts uh -huh. and i feel like that's where a point where we're getting at right now there's i don't i haven't gathered eggs and i don't know how long on, on here because uh -huh. the kids are able to do it and that frees me up to do so many other bigger tasks which I can focus more on bigger vision things and help us to grow in other ways than just focusing on some of the smaller, uh, minute tasks of the homestead. Mm -hmm. Like more focusing on the business instead of being in the business. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Our three-year-old yesterday just successfully used the screw gun to drive his first screw. There we go. Uh, <laughs> and I, it's not like I was like, oh, I don't know if you should be doing that because it's, <laughs> I don't know how safe that is, but he did it and he was very proud of himself. <laughs> That's great. That's how like my four-year-old, he likes to do stuff like that too. <laughs> yes. Now I know a lot of your time is focused on the YouTube channel. Would you classify that as, let's say, an agritainment channel or just like a journal? Or how do you uh, how do you classify what you do there? I guess it would be considered an agritainment. I've never used that specific term for it before, but that fits perfectly because uh, we do we do inspire to to entertain and keep it enjoyable and fun. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're not necessarily doing how to videos every time. We we try to uh, we bring the whole. I try to bring the whole family in in videos as much as possible and. 
but we also try to get out and, and uh, tour other farms and showcase them and other people what they're doing. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of like our, our family, you're, you're joining, a, uh, living vicariously through us and, and sharing our family adventures along with us. And, and hopefully that we, we encourage people and inspire them and, and that they learn something a little bit along the way. Mm-hmm. So it's really more just sharing the journey, sharing the process of what's going on. Exactly right. Yeah. Now, would you say that, um, I mean, I guess the, the question I get a lot of people from, well, is that really how it happened there? And I'm like, you know, I'm sure there's like editing that involves because obviously there's, 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 there's failed takes. I mean, you would, uh, and my, <laughs> the limited videos we make, I mean, my wife has, um, has laughed more times at me. Um, I said something completely inappropriate the other day, trying to say something while we were filming irrigation videos. So, um, but yeah, talk to us a little bit about that aspect, because I know there's probably, I'm sure that can be tiring sometimes of just all the work and effort and just, uh, mental space that goes into creating that content. Yeah. Um, and this is probably something a lot of people don't think about, um, a lot of times like it will make, if you're trying to video yourself doing it, doing a certain task, it'll it'll make that task stretch out and it'll be longer to do video in it than it would be without video in it. So you're usually setting up your camera you start doing something and then you kind of move to a different angle, especially if you want to keep it interesting, Uh uh, switching up the angle. So you have to think about those times of transition. And so uh, in some ways it, it is what we're doing and it is like reality, but then there are also times where you're having to, to adjust just because, it has you have to make it work to fit on video mm-hmm. for people to even want to watch it if we were just to set the video camera up and just let it hit record while we're doing something uh it's going to be boring you may hear, <laughs> hear yeah you don't want to hear <laughs> 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 so so uh mostly it, it is real it's just giving you uh there's just edits and adjust adjustments to make it suitable for tv Mm-hmm. not that we're doing anything inappropriate or anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I get that. I absolutely get that. Um, yeah. I've, I've watched a, a number of your videos and I, I really, you've done some longer form stuff, which is really, it, it tells a story. And I think that's obviously what you're going for. There is just really telling the, the full story of like a visit someplace or doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's uh that's really what, what, what really is kind of like pulls people in is just seeing the, the whole beginning and end of things. One of the things that I learned when I was really studying film and, and things like that is that when, when people are attracted to, I don't know, pick your movie, your Star Wars or yeah. whatever, they're usually attracted to the characters in the story and what the characters go through. So those are some of the things that I, I keep in mind, even as we're just video and say we're just doing a bed prep, that I yeah. try to share a little bit about each person individually so that way somebody connects with one of the characters of us or whatever that's that's kind of how it is just in, in film and tv shows mm-hmm. in general you find ca- characters that you connect with and that you like or you dislike and that keeps you watching mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very cool a couple months ago you did a video about racism you know as 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 you said you know as a mixed race farmer can you share your thoughts on addressing that in farming uh, as far as dealing with it or as far as on the broad and scope of uh, just in the world? Well, you know, I would love both. You okay. know, talk to us about you're in the South. Um, yeah. You know, talk to us about dealing with it. I would say a lot of people have a misconception about the South that it is a racist place to be in. I have found mm-hmm. personally that that is not the case. Uh, I have found in general that um, there's a lot of false narratives that are out there about racism that frankly aren't true. And uh, I'm not dismissing and saying that no one's ever experienced having to deal with racism or dealing with problems with other people. And I also want to say that just because you have harsh dealings or some negative experience with someone who is different than you, that doesn't necessarily mean that that comes from a source of racism or hatred towards you or your skin color. And uh, those are some of the false things that have been promoted right now. And and people are just a lot of people are just jumping all over it and there's a lot of a lot of lies and things are just not true or even half truths mm-hmm. um i actually i personally feel that um prior to this year I, I felt like overall especially uh 
around here or in our, probably even in our country that I feel like racism was not a huge problem. That doesn't mean that I'm saying it, it didn't exist and that no uh-huh. one is. But as far as looking back in, in history, I feel like we were at a really, really good place. And I feel like what is happening right now is actually making it worse, mm. not better. So, um, yeah. Okay. So you would say that it's, it's what's happening right now is really actually bringing it more to a forefront than we actually have had in the last couple of years. It is. And, and when people are starting to do, uh, when they start acting in a way that is, is at, uh, of, out of anger, out of bitterness, it's, it's just, it doesn't, and uncivilized, it makes it, it makes problems worse, not better. It makes it harder to bring uh, equality and, and, and to raise all people up in a way that you should when everybody is working and operating based on emotion and things that they've watched on TV and the emotions that have been promoted on TV. It just makes things harsher and, and, and more negative to deal with. And it's just not good atmosphere to deal with. You need to be calm. You need to be civilized and you need to talk things out. Mm. And uh, another, there's, there's a lot of problems that contribute to the, the problems we're having right now. And one is we've been sowing seeds in our society that are, have made people through our political correctness or whatever, ultra sensitive, easily offended and unforgiving. Mm. And with, with that, we're like, we tear people down just because they may say something that is quote unquote politically incorrect or whatever, or or maybe somebody says something that is that somebody finds offensive or mm. that may be not very sensitive. They're quick to label them as racist. And, and we quickly just start tearing people down because they're allegedly a racist. And mm. that, that is just not right. It's not. Mm-hmm. So uh, would you say that, um, you know, I know that you recently have made a bunch of videos for Polyface. Um, you know, I know that you've, um, you interacted with them and, uh, that's something that's, you know, on the, on the hot front burner right now. Um, you know, share about that. Was that trip pre-planned or? Um, I had been wanting to meet Joel Salton for years. I had never had the chance of actually personally meeting him and then just being inspired by him and all the work that he has done over the years. I, I really just thought that he was a person that I wanted to be around. Mm. And uh, there was a negative situation that came up on, on Instagram. And I actually finally got into just a conversation with the people at Polyface Farm. And I was like, you got, I, I really, really would like to come out there and, and see your place and, and meet Joel. And, and <clears throat> they treated me just like everybody else with well, open door policy, as Joel says it in. And my whole family went out there and we had the absolute best time of our life getting mm-hmm. to know Joel, his family, the, the stewards and stewards there and employees there and the work that they're doing is amazing. And getting to actually know Joel, um, mm-hmm. prior to that, I had this feeling of like, because you never know what uh, the people that you kind of look to, uh, look up to, or you see on TV or YouTube, what they're really going to be like in person. Mm-hmm. You really don't mm-hmm. have any, any clue. So I was like, I really hope he's the person I, I think he is, but I'm not sure. Mm. And then actually getting to meet him and connect with him was, I was like, you know what? He is the person that I thought he would be. And even more, mm-hmm. super nice guy, super kind, super caring. Actually, when we got there, our, our tire had was going flat on our car. And uh, he was like, oh, bring it on over to the shop. And then he actually personally helped us change the tire. And, yeah. And then we just spent hours with him i was blown away by the time that he took just to spend with me connect with me getting to know me and my family and 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 just and then getting to know the different stewards that he has around there and and them expressing their experience there and it wasn't scripted i pulled them to the side at different times nobody really knew exactly what i was doing with that but they were hearing the positive experiences that they were having and i was like you know what there is no way this, this, this man deserves to be tore down. And even and no one really does, but him, him particularly, I, I'm a, just an even bigger fan of Joel's now after spending time with him. That's one of the goals that I have on our YouTube channel is to show people of all walks of life, whoever you are, just to doing great things. Sometimes I even get challenged sometimes of not having so-called people of color, which I hate that term because 
everybody has a color. I think that's just a, uh, one of those phrases and agendas that just kind of separate people mm. more, but I kind of digress on that. But we all just need to showcase and learn from one another, whatever your background is and whatever your skin color is, you can learn from anybody and, mm. and take what they've learned and implement it and, and, and kind of build here and there. Hey, you recognize a person over here. You like what they're doing just in this one area. Okay. Take that skill. You may not like everything else, but you can do one thing and we can all just learn from each other and, and build uh, together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's a little bit about the, the, the background. I know because we kind of focused on the deep aspect of it right now, but like, do you feel that there's things that we should be doing now to kind of focus on um, to kind of like um, with the history of racism in, in, in the U.S.? Um, are there ways that we can like make sure that we're focusing on not building that up? Well, one of the things is, is kind of the way we're focusing on it kind of makes people even more hypersensitive to it. And it's like, we're quick to just kind of like turn people in for like so-called being a racist because we're so hypersensitive about it. Mm. Um, and I think if part of it is we just need to turn off a lot of the media and just start connecting with each other. Like a lot of us do anyways in this industry. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times, and the more we connect and, and communicate, and talk and get to know each other, that's going to be what resolves problems. The more we listen to, to the, all the narratives and the agendas out there in the media and things that are even circulated in social media, the more we kind of, we, we get brainwashed and, and start having feelings and, and are, are programmed to have certain feelings and, and believe certain things that, that aren't necessarily true. Uh, and, and a lot of times, and uh, I don't necessarily want to, just totally use this time to beat up the media, but people need to stop and think, what does the, ben the media benefit from? They don't benefit from us having good lives and us really solving the problems of everybody being equal. They really, really don't want that because that's gonna cause them to lose money because they get views and, and money from just stirring things up and people tuning in to watch drama and, and violence and things that really don't bring us life, good life. Mm. Mm. No, that's a huge point. I mean, that's, it's an, I think it's an epidemic in the U S and the world is just like the 24 hour news cycle of it just is. this and that and the other, because it, again, right now, and especially it used to be the TV that they could, you know, call and do surveys, but now they can literally know in seconds and they can a B test pages with different words to see which gets more clicks. And yep. so they've basically built themselves a formula for the title and a formula for the first couple paragraphs that suck you in yep, and right. get you incensed. Um, which again is allows them to sell more ad space. Yep. So it's um, yeah, it's 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 definitely something that's not solving things. And I think I like exactly what you said there. And unfortunately, they've also now divided us too that we can't get together because of the whole COVID thing. Exactly. Right. Um, but you know, getting in person, sitting down with people across the table, and saying, "Hey, I hear you. I want to understand you. How can I understand more of what you're feeling, what your thoughts are about this?" Exactly I think right. that is where we need to be. And uh, it's not happening, unfortunately. Exactly right. And uh, yeah, I could keep going on with that too. But also when you, when you are connecting with somebody, whether it be in person or on social media, to really get control over your emotions. Some, a lot of times we just can, we go after individuals uh -huh. who maybe said something wrong. But to calm down, think civilized, approach matters in a civil way, in a loving way, and to see whoever they are that you're dealing with as, as equal in God's sight, like every single human being is, we should all be equal and strive to equalize things, not to lift up anybody higher than the other, but to, to, to approach uh -huh. it with the sense of equality. Because personally, I don't feel what's being promoted right now is equality. Mm. I feel like we're getting, there's a cultural Marxism that's being promoted right now and a sense of division among all peoples. And we really, what we need to solve matters is really, not division, but connection and, uh, and forgiveness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. All right, let's switch a bit to new farmers. And I guess, uh, Mike, would you say you're still a new farmer? Would you say you're starting to get over that hump? Because I think the USDA technically classifies people under 10 years uh, of farming would still be a new farmer. 
I'll, I'll take that new farmer lo- label. I'll, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> the USDA passes out money more, e- more easily to beginning farmers. So, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers make is, though? Oh, uh, try to narrow it down to the biggest one. There's, there's, there's three that I think of. Okay. And these are mistakes that I've made and uh, have had to learn from. Uh, one is trying to do too much right off the bat. I, I think most new farmers should really narrow their focus down and, and just try to focus on one major area and, and build that at a time. Too often we're spreading ourselves too thin and then we're not doing anything well. Like mm. when we started our homestead, we were trying to do chickens. We were trying to do ducks. We were trying to do goats. We were trying to do the garden. We were still trying to do other little homestead skills as well mm. as me still working off the homestead. And that was a bad idea. So uh. really try to narrow your focus down and, uh, and, and figure out what your, your focus of your farm will be. And then as you really try to get, as you get better and develop certain infrastructures and things and skills, then you can start adding on to that. Uh-huh. Another uh-huh. thing would be if you're working off, off the farm, off the homestead, is don't leave that job too early where you get yourself in a bad place to where you, you, can't, you can't financially do anything. Uh, I mentioned earlier about phasing and making uh, progressional changes. Uh, try to do that. And, and then another one that I made was neglecting your personal health and self-care. Uh, hmm. A lot of times, we're, especially if you're younger, you're full with energy and you're just trying to do everything and you're burning the candle at both ends and then bam, you get hit with burnout and that's a bad place to be. And then you start having health problems and everything else. Don't hmm. neglect your personal healthcare. And one of the, one of the things that I say is you can't have a healthy homestead or farm without having a healthy homestead or farmer. You, you have to be healthy yourself to be able to manage and run the homestead, the farm, uh, the way it needs to be. Mm, mm, mm. That is such a good one because I have seen so many people with their bodies break down. And, you know, one of the reasons why I advocate tractor farming is there's a reason tractors were made and invented to do a lot of the big heavy work that people, um, you know, used to do by hand. And I think for some reason, people think that it's great to do it by hand again, when literally for less than an ounce of diesel fuel, you can probably, uh, you know, for some of these smaller farms or a couple ounces of diesel fuel, you know, instead of broad forking for days on end, you could just do a deep rip of that entire farm. Yeah. Yeah. I I totally, totally agree with that. And that's one of the things that I've had to find the balance of, because mm. you still want to get some exercise where you're not just doing everything where you actually mm-hmm. have to find a way to get exercise, like go to the gym, which you don't necessarily have to do if you're outside just being physically active. doing. What yeah. You're doing. But then there's that balance of where you're not just killing yourself. Like when I first started off with our gardening, I did everything by hand and then my body was just breaking down way back. Mm. So mm-hmm. you want to find that balance of finding the right tools. Like if you need a tractor or a BCS or whatever, depending on your skill, figure that out, but then also making sure that you're mindful that you do get some exercise, whether it be 30 to, 30 to 60 minutes of something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you, you would recommend like 30 to 60 minutes of some sort of intense um, activity. Exactly right. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. And so what in your book counts as intense activity? Well, maybe I shouldn't say intense, but I should say some type of physical activity where you're getting your heart pumping and depending on your fitness level, and this could differ from, from person to person, maybe somebody can go uh, more intense. Maybe somebody needs to be a little bit more moderate or somebody uh-huh. needs to be really, really a beginner. But even things like broad forking or, or stair up hoeing or just shoveling or, uh-huh. or if you're doing other things like homesteading, you can splitting wood, things like that. Just be uh-huh. mindful that, hey, I need to get exercise in today. How am I going to do it? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to broad fork this uh-huh. hundred foot, hundred foot or 50 foot bend, whatever. And uh, maybe you time it, see how fast you can do it. That way you kind of get your heart rate up a little bit more. And uh-huh. then other times, once you've gotten that exercise in, then you, then you go to using your machines to, to, to actually get the job done more efficiently, but uh, just finding that balance. Mm, no, that's good. Um, they do say, I think they do say that vegetable farmers have one of the highest um, calorie needs of any farmer just I because of the, that. yeah, <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you go and give to your new farmer self? Let's see. One would be 
especially when the time of discouragement came is before that I would warn myself that you're, you're over romanticizing this right now is, is it there, it, it will be good, but it's going to be really, really hard and don't give up because it's going to be worth it. You're going to go through some tough stuff and maybe multiple times, but in the end, it's going to be worth it to be able to taste the, the fruits of your labor, the, uh. the things that you, you spend hours of, upon hours and day after day in doing just tasting it seeing others enjoy it and appreciate it whether it be your family whether it be your customers and and just seeing the environment around you take shape something that was wilderness overgrown see it become a manicured area that you're bringing glorification to that's uh-huh. it. it will be rewarding to see that and it will feel really good mm, absolutely if you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Well, probably, <laughs> probably landscape fabric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can agree with you on that one. <laughs> I, I don't like to fight weeds. It's a constant battle. But especially if you're growing things like your lettuces, uh, having a landscape fabric to put down, I'd much prefer that than having to weed it by hand every day. <laughs> uh-huh. 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 Do you have a specific pattern that you like to plant in landscape fabric or do you just do various depending on the crop? I actually do. <laughs> Partly because I'm probably OCD too, but I like to see the color pattern of the red, green, red, green. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it just looks neat to see those, see those colors like that lined up. Okay. Gotcha. Um, do you believe that now is the best time to be starting to farm? I think now is always the best time to get started with doing something, growing something, especially after this year of seeing the instability of our food uh-huh. system and how things could easily, the grocery stores could easily be empty. Uh-huh. Uh, we need to, everyone needs to start growing something and then connect with others who are growing things that you're not growing. Uh, uh-huh. We really need to do our part to be, less dependent on corporations and the government and take more responsibility for our own food, providing our food and our own health as well. And doing, starting growing something, it Uh it will make a difference. Whether you're deciding to be a farmer right now or not, maybe you can progress and do get to the point where you're doing that, but everybody needs to grow something. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I love that. Everyone needs to grow something. And it can be simple. I mean, it can be microgreens on your counter. It can be mushrooms in your basement. Actually, Mike, when we bought this house, um, our, we have a cellar underneath our, our, our house. And in our cellar, it's just, it's a little bit moist. So I actually like looked at the temperatures and everything. And actually, it would be a perfect mush- mushroom cave. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Although I am like, I'm not going to, because I don't want to any chance of getting, you know, infecting my 130 year old beams down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, don't do that. <laughs> but I did, I did talk to my wife about that and we ended up putting two dehumidifiers down there to try to bring that humidity down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can grow something, even if it's a, a simple herb plant on your windowsill. Exactly right. And where can people find out more about you? Uh, feel free to check me out and my family on our YouTube channel, The Fit Farmer. We're also on Instagram. I'm on Instagram as The Fit Farmer. Uh, on Facebook a little bit too, but uh, you can follow along the stories and, and all the other farmers that we have opportunity to visit on our YouTube channel and uh, uh-huh. check us out there. And you've got a couple of videos on ducks, which I love because I am a huge duck fan. Um, yeah, they're great. They're messy, but great. <laughs> All right, Michael, this has been great. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective and uh, how you're doing your farm and uh, making it work. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. And now a word from one of our sponsors. FarmBrig is an online platform that was created to address the high bankruptcy rate, 19% in 2009 alone among farmers. By giving farms access to local consumers, education, and lean farming techniques, FarmBrig is the global epicenter for local farming communities. Farms that sign up on FarmBrig will have a farm profile to be searched by local consumers, a place to post jobs, find farm workers, be associated with farmers markets, sell products online, and access lean farming and other business resources. Visit farmbrig.com, that is farm, B-R-I-G-G-E.com to learn more. 
Next week on the podcast, I will be joined by Roger Wasson from Farm to Table Talk. Now, this is a very interesting interview. We kind of interview each other. It was, we were actually going to release the podcast on both channels, his podcast, the Farm to Table Talk podcast, as well as this one, the Thriving Farmer podcast. But we have a great interaction. Roger comes from more large-scale ag, working in the trade associations, helping, uh, so let's say, almonds go from 300 million pounds to 3 billion pounds of sales sales annually. So we talk about how big ag works, how they market, how Roger has facilitated that, lessons for the small farm around that. And then I share with Roger how the small farm movement is taking over agriculture and um, how it is the future of our food system. So join me next week. It's a great podcast. We both thoroughly enjoyed the exchange, the dialogue. I wouldn't say argument. It was more of a discussion, but it was still great. So next week, Roger Wasson on the podcast. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.